Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me and for all you folks that are here bright and early this morning. Thank you. I am Deborah Sampira. I'm one of the co-founders of Althea. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you a little bit about what we do and how we've been building decentralized ISPs here in the U.S. and also in um, Africa. Um, so essentially, Althea is software that um, enables anyone to bring high-speed internet and connect their neighbors. Um, it works on consumer routers. And um, you can earn money automatically by adding capacity to the network, um, like hosting antennas or um, running cables to your neighbor. And then you get paid automatically for adding that capacity. So let's start with why decentralized? Like, what's, what's wrong with our centralized ISPs right now? And um, I think this is kind of a, a, a poignant graph here. So there um, are um, the percentage of consumers with access to broadband at $60 a month or less is, is pitifully low. And actually, you can see even in Colorado, it's at 3%. And um, kind of one of the key features to this graph is that I think we all kind of know that um, you know, legacy ISPs are, are slow. They're often expensive. There's a lot of problems with customer service. But um, in fact, actually cost is the number one reason why people in the US don't have access to, to internet. And this is actually one of the things that we found to be true, is that there's a kind of a large uncounted market um, of folks that uh, are not able to get access, either it's because the monthly cost is too high or it's really inflexible, um, where they might be able to pay $70 a month, one month for internet, but then um, perhaps they get behind on their bill, then it goes to collections, and then it's a four or five hundred dollar bill to get reconnected, and so then they just kind of drop out of that whole marketplace of even being able to access the internet. Um, and this is because it's highly monopolized. Sixty-five percent of connected U.S. households get internet from just two of the larger cable companies, and even if we zoom out, there's only two thousand seven hundred ISPs in all of the U.S., which might seem like a big number but there's 9,000 Boost Mobile stores. So <laughs> we have much more choice when it comes to like cell carriers or other like our hamburger um, stands than we do over our internet service provider. Um, and one of, one of the things about that is it reduces our choice for cost, it reduces our, our ability to get faster internet. They're not incentivized, legacy ISPs aren't incentivized to provide um, more access, more capacity, or at a lower cost. And uh, one of the things that I found out working in Denver here is that a lot of folks are even under a contract, which doesn't help you. It only you know, siphons more money um, to the carriers. And then the other kind of big reason here that monopolies are a bad thing is one of the reasons, one of the ways that cable um, ISPs collect revenue, which is by collecting our data or by throttling um, or censoring, and that's a that's kind of a, a big big reason why I am doing what we're doing and why I came to this project in the first place. In fact, my background is in um, net neutrality activism and and um, protecting the kind of the open freedoms that we enjoy on the internet, the ability to associate with who we want to, the ability to be able to to see information that we want to see and be able to have a freedom of speech. And I had worked for many years on this um, with the sort of regulatory uh, framework, trying to move the needle or, or protect these things from a legislative standpoint with my senators and um, through a kind of traditional means of activism. And then I realized pretty quickly, though, um, that we couldn't, we couldn't protect them that way. There was, real, there was always, even if we could get legislation passed, um, that was always um, going to be precarious. And I remember kind of poignantly one example kind of sitting around a table where we were talking about, um, you know, net neutrality and protecting those freedoms. And I, I was talking about how cable companies were um, moving forward with cementing in their ability to throttle and censor. And um, my, one, of, one, of the, one of the senators there had said, I asked them, well, what are you, what, what's the plans? And, and they said they didn't have any, that they were going to be reactive. Um, they're just going to react to these things as they came along. And so then I knew that there, weren't, there wasn't, in fact, going to be any progress made there. But perhaps if we could hold the infrastructure of the Internet in a decentralized way, that we could all have pieces of that, that, that they would sort of lock in the democracy and the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, and one kind of other example here that I think stays with me, um, and one of the, another kind of thing that keeps me going and on this project is um, 
I remember a, a keynote speech from a CenturyLink talk executive at a broadband conference, and he was talking about how lucrative it was, in fact, to um, be able to control the experience um, of Wi-Fi for resorts, basically saying, hey, look, if you're a Las Vegas resort or you're Disneyland, it's really great to make sure people have your Wi-Fi because, in fact, they could prove that they could shape your experience and keep you spending more money or going to certain restaurants just by what you see on the Internet. So it's, it's very important that we move the needle now, that we build these decentralized ISPs, that we take back the infrastructure of the Internet. So this is kind of how we see the internet now, right? It's siloed. Each of the carriers are different colors. You're, you're, you're sort of stuck oftentimes on a contract or even just by the inflexibility of moving from carrier to carrier. Um, you have to you know, get signed up. There's often an installation fee. It takes time. But Althea's vision is that you can seamlessly switch from AT&T to CenturyLink to your local provider on even a second-by-second -second basis that your router in your home is going to make the best decision for you based not only on quality of the connection, but on price, and that you would have control over that, and that you could seamlessly add capacity and sell bandwidth. And so that's what we did. So sort of the key kind of function with Althea is the price-aware routing protocol, which means that our variant of a Babel mesh routing protocol will not only take into account the quality of the route based on round-trip time, It'll also take into account the lower cost. So while people can seamlessly add capacity to the network, adding antennas to the roof, selling bandwidth to the neighbors, their neighbors can also, when given more upstream providers, uh, easily control. On, this, is a, uh, this is a setting right here in their router dashboard where they can control on a second-by-second -second basis if they want cheaper bandwidth or higher quality connection. So how does it look like in the real world? So here's our, our kind of first network, and you're going to see kind of a lot of pictures here. This is a, a rural Oregon network um, that we built. It was our first proof of concept and where I live. I've lived in this town for about 13 years and um, definitely seen the pain points that people have around getting access to the Internet. I mean, we uh, before our network came to be, most folks had megabit per second Internet, it's $60 a month or more. And this is pretty common. And it wasn't like there wasn't other op uh, options that were, had been proposed and other solutions that had been proposed and tried, but they had all primarily failed. In fact, there was even a, a million-dollar grant for a community of around 2,000 people for a fixed wireless and, and fiber infrastructure. Um, and the ISP who got that grant did build some, um, some fiber at 10 megabits per second, um, and some fixed wireless, and then they sold all that infrastructure to a larger ISP who had no incentive to sustain it. There's not enough of a market that they can see there, and they didn't, they're not going to spend their own CapEx. So we ended up, shortly after spending a million dollars of, of, of taxpayer money, in very much the same situation. So um, what's really exciting to see is, is our solution working in the real world and that the, the community, in fact, holds the infrastructure of this network in a very decentralized way and that the revenue produced in this network stays in Oregon, in this, in this network. So you'll see here kind of the, this example right here is what a, what, what a relay looks like. So this is a, to kind of what most folks will have to add capacity to the network. That top antenna will connect to a... Um, uh, uh, the main network, and in this case, that top antenna, and this is at Matt's house, is connecting to um, a, a, what we call a gateway in town, and that gateway has an access to a wholesale fiber connection. Um, in this case, it's 500 megabits per second. Oftentimes, it's going to be a gigabit per second. And then the antenna down below, they see the kind of tall, skinny one, is a sector antenna, and that connects about four of his neighbors. Um, and then those are both wired to just like an Althea router in his home. Just real simple commodity hardware um, that's flashed with our software. And then our software does all of the, the routing, the billing, and, um, and provides internet for his home, just like a normal router would do. So what happens here is that um, Matt makes money automatically for his four connected neighbors. And we can see the sort of viral network effect that happens. In fact, Matt, every Saturday, will take a bottle of wine go knock on his neighbor's door and um, say, hey, you want to get connected to some internet? <laughs> so 
so um, so the, the, the network grows sort of organically and, and naturally. Um, uh, and another kind of key part of our incentive structure is that not only do the routers provide um, automatic compensation for those folks who are providing infrastructure capacity, we do also realize that Matt does not want to be woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning um, from a call from one of his neighbors that the internet's not working. So we have a monthly prorated, like daily recurring cost that gets remitted to a group of what we call organizers. So what this looks like is a, a business or a nonprofit, or in the case of Classic Nights, a member-owned cooperative. And those are the folks that help install antennas, um, who uh, provide customer service, who help make, manage the radios. And so for Matt, the experience is very much just passive. He just has the gear in his house. He um, gets paid automatically. And um, about every couple of months, he'll cash out his, uh, you know, he makes about 40 a month. So he'll cash out about 100 bucks every two months. And what this does, too, is it allowed us to build in a place where fixed wireless had failed before. So instead of renting expensive towers that were you know, $1,500 a month to rent, we're able to utilize private property um, in a really agile, agile way. As you can see kind of from this graph. So this is pretty early on in the network. Um, we've since grown quite a bit since, since this. But um, the different colors represent you know, sort of different relays here. And as you can see, the geography is very challenging in this area. It, so in order to really, if we were going to do a centralized network, We'd be spending, you know, between three and five thousand dollars a month just in having enough tower capacity to reach behind all of these sort of hills and, and large Douglas fir trees and this kind of thing. But with with Althea, we're able to actually, um, you know, bounce from home to home in a really sort of agile uh, way, uh, and then everybody makes sort of money automatically. Um, another sort of key component. Um, of our infrastructure is what we call an exit node, which is um, it, it's just the VPN or server of the data center that does all of our kind of network addressing. It also um, does the route verification. So someone doesn't advertise too cheap of a router um, and route all the traffic through that node. Um, and it also absolves the network organizers from having to deal with the legal complications of running an ISP, which in the United States isn't really too bad. Um, but they can just simply set up a local area network. Um, and it also gives people choice. Right now, we are, um, Althea is running the exit nodes that, are, that show up on the, the list of, in, the, in your router dashboard. But we eventually hope that you know, there will be maybe diff very, lots of different kinds of um, exit node so people have more choice over where their traffic is actually peering out to the internet. And this actually, um, an example from our, our Abuja Nigeria network came into play. We, um, we were building in Abuja and we had everyone set to, you know, the routers came kind of default selected to our Lagos um, uh, African exit node. And when, one day we were building, and we said, the, hey, there's, there's no, there's, Lagos isn't showing up, it's having problems. And so we just switched everyone over very seamlessly to our South American exits, um, and everybody had internet. We came to actually find out that the submarine cable had been cut um, to Nigeria, so much of, the, uh, much of Nigeria's internet infrastructure was dark. But in fact, our network there in Diplomat Park in Abuja, Nigeria, was going strong, being able to easily, with you know, just a click of the button, switch over to a different you know, exit node, where, a way of peering out to the internet. Um, and then, uh, of course, our networks are um, paid in, in cryptocurrency. It's, um, we have two selections, Ethereum or XDAI, um, which is a stable currency. So the, and for most of our networks, they're using XDAI, although we do realize that Ethereum is easier to procure. So we have a bridge um, that allows people to buy Ethereum, send it to their routers, and then it bridges to XDAI. So here's an example of someone who's making some money. And this guy actually has um, he's a little bit bigger setup, as you can see there. And she was that kind of green link, if you saw there on the, the previous slide. And uh, she makes close to about 80 bucks a month. Um, it's doing pretty well. You can see there's her kind of ether scan there uh, back when we were originally doing uh, Ethereum. And, um, and so for her, she, she's it's very passive. She gets all of that, um, her internet from her router. And, and then essentially she goes on. What, the way that she sees it and the way it feels is that she gets her internet, and then about once a month she cashes out 80 bucks. 
um, with an app on her phone, which is in fact Coinbase that's going right to her fiat. But for her, it feels just very, very simple and, and, and easy. And all the maintenance is done by the local kind of network organizer. And then here's some of the disconnected neighbors, and um, which kind of exciting is that um, you see folks like Clark over here on the left, right? So he originally just was getting connected, but now he's a relay and connect more people from there. Um, it's really kind of neat to see, like in this previous slide here, this one, this gal also was just a regular user. And then I had mentioned that she was in a really great spot to be able to connect up more of her neighbors and earn some money. I came back the next day. Her husband had the backhoe out. Several trees were down. <laughs> and, and just to sort of see that transformation being from, becoming, from being a passive internet user to someone who is a um, participant in the network, an owner of the network, and all those sort of things that we think about when we think about decentralization, the ethos of that. Um, coming to life and fruition with you know this uh, older retired couple was it, it, it's really really rewarding. It's very exciting to see. Um, so here's Clark on the left there. Now he's also a relay as well. Um, and then on the top right is one of my favorite stories too. This is um, Beatrice's home, and uh, Beatrice uh, is about 16. And for the last four years, she didn't have any internet uh, due to cost reasons and just lack of access. So, um, and that had kept her staying late at school and not being able to see her, um, to see her family, to spend time with them because they would work two jobs. So when we came that day and set up, you know, 70 megabit per second internet that she could afford and her family could afford, and seeing her hold her laptop and say, this is the best day ever, it is really, is really pretty exciting. Um, so another sort of feature of having the, the, the mesh routing protocol is redundancy. So here you can see two upstream providers at a, a, a local business in town. And um, if one of those antennas were to, to kind of fail, like in that main kind of purple link over there, all of, the, um, all of the clients of that one relay will reroute and add redundancy uh, to the network. They'll automatically reroute to that. Um, so we only have about five minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through the rest of this pretty quickly here. Um, we've seen a lot of the kind of the, the uh, rural area, but of course this is actually really applicable in urban areas as well. Um, again, because that sort of underlying reason is actually cost, not necessarily that we don't have the infrastructure there, people can't actually afford it. Um, and one of the compelling things about what we did in Tacoma, which is an area kind of south of Seattle, very urban, is um, we use 60 gigahertz antennas, which is you know, what some people may refer, refer to as 5G. But one of the things about these types of antennas, you get very high throughput, several hundred megabits per second, up to a gigabit per second, is they have to be very close together. And one of the struggles that Verizon and AT&T have had in deploying these networks is getting the right of way access, all the coordination. And in fact, I believe that um, when you, even when you're laying fiber, about 70% of the cost is in the right of way. So this is where that, um, where Althea is really a powerful model because using private property, we can locate these antennas very close by and build it neighbor to neighbor. And then Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, also some really exciting stuff happening here. This was an area where they had no fixed access to the home at all and only mobile at around $3 a gigabyte. So our network here, we, um, we started about a month ago. We have a, a, a core of 16 people that we're adding about two or three users a month to. Um, and then we've just rolled out with a Wi-Fi hotspot access point so that each node in the network, each household that has Althea, can also serve their neighbor's um, mobile phones. So for each node, we anticipate a further three to 10 users um, that are able to connect to that. So we're really, gonna, we're, we're really excited to see the rapid growth that's possible here in Africa. Um, so we started there in Abuja in Diplomat Park. It's run by a local business person, um, yeah, Yakubu, up there on the top right. And um, he works together with his local mosque, who runs the sort of gateway there that brings in that kind of high-speed fiber line. And then uh, Lagos Network is starting soon. And actually, we also just started a network in Ghana this last week, too. So really excited about what's happening there in, um, in Africa. 
Really quickly, we have both a cash-based kind of on-ramp, and then um, we also have um, uh, with debit cards. And for cash-based, we have a really simple mobile wallet for XDAI called Effectivo. Um, Yax refers to the XDAI as data credits in a really kind of understandable way for the people there. And then they already have merchants that sit under these big shaded umbrellas um, that are identified as the, the kind of merchants that can do mobile money and, and digital money. So uh, it was very kind of easy to introduce these concepts there to those folks that were already used to going to these um, umbrella merchants <laughs> who, who could then take cash and um, remit digital payment to their routers. And they just sync their, we just sync their mobile wallet to their router wallet. So uh, scanning the QR code instantly loads up their router wallet. And, and, um, and in many of our networks, that people want to use a debit card. So we, we use kind of a combination of both. We use com a Coinbase app, um, which is, is pretty good. Uh, we actually just integrated the wire widget into the dashboard, which is amazing. Feels very seamless. It really obfuscates a lot of the you know sort of back end of the crypto. There's no talk about investment or anything like that. So it very much feels like you're just paying for your internet with your debit card. Um, and then there's a lot of features on our routers that give people control back of their usage, um, that show how much they've been using, how much they've been paying, how much they've been earning. And then a text message when they get low informs them that they need to top up or add funds. So what does it look like to grow? So in fact, as, we, as Althea grows and as we move into new markets, um, we have kind of really worked hard to work out the friction points and, and the, the, the pain points of starting a new, like new ISP, because this is really, you know, in telecom itself. So this is an example of one of those networks. This is Toronto Wireless in Denver that just got started. Um, we come in with a demand aggregation site um, that, that helps uh, folks get pre-registrations um, and uh, marketing materials and help people get that high-speed fiber line and, and get equipment. And all those things are kind of under our package. So if you want to start a new network, it's very easy to do that with, with Althea. And actually, I'm just going to wrap up again with the siloed legacy ISPs that we have now and the, the dream of the one open, seamless network where you're instantly switching from carriers on a second-by-second -second basis. Thank you very, very much. I know it's early. Thank you so much.